Dr. Richard Farragher is Professor of Biological Gerontology at the University of Brighton and has been studying the relationship between cellular senescence and aging for more than 30 years. He is one of the country's leading experts on aging and has become one of only three British academics ever to win a Glenn Award for research. He recently led a team showing the reversal of cellular senescence with derivatives of resveratrol. And with that, let me start the interview. Professor Varga, you are a professor of gerontology at the University of Brighton, and you specialize in the mechanisms and consequences of cellular senescence, right? So thank you for joining us on Modern Health Span. It's a pleasure to have you with us here today. It's a pleasure to be here, Richard. Thank you. So what I'd like to start with, actually, is what is your theory of aging? So why do we age in the first place? Okay. There's why we age and how we age, and they're two separate questions. Why we age is why does aging exist in the biosphere at all? Why does any organism age? Mm. And any theory that um, seeks to provide a rationale for that also has to explain why there are what we call non-aging organisms. And the best way to go into this is to ask that simplest of all questions that everybody kind of skirts around, which is what actually is aging. Mm. Um, your theory of aging doesn't mean much if you and I have uh, different ideas of what we're talking about. So if you're a biologist and you are interested in aging, the place you start is populations of organisms. So if you took a population of organisms and you put them in an environment where they were protected from natural accidents and predators, and you followed them over time, and you saw an increase in the rates of death and sickness in that population over time, that would be a population of organisms that show aging. This is such an obvious observation that most people don't even realize that it's special. You know, if you take 50 cats and keep them in a cat's home from kittens to the time they die, you will see them all show this exponential increase in death and mortality. That does not happen with all organisms. There are a very few organisms, probably the most famous is Arctica islandica. Um, and if any, uh, any of the listeners have had clam chowder, then you have eaten these guys. And the clams in your bowl of clam chowder were almost certainly older than you are. And the very oldest Arctica are so old that, um, that Shakespeare could have had them in a bowl of, of stew. They're well over 400 years old. And... The reason, or one of the reasons that they hang around for so long is that they do not show an increase in their chance of and it's low. And so if you have a low but um, fixed chance of death per year, on average, you will clock up an awful lot of years. All right. I mean, and just to to clear the ground a little bit as and as the clams in your clam chowder could tell you being non-aging doesn't make you immortal all right at, at some point you will get unlucky either intrinsically or extrinsically and so why we age is that field of evolutionary biology that says why is this exponential increase in death and sickness so common in the biosphere that we seem to think of it as a universal. But at the same time, you get these rare exceptions. And basically, the reason this happens is that all aging, all natural selection measures is what we call fitness, which is a combination of your ability to survive and your ability to reproduce. And so for aging to be so common, it must or be occurring by a mechanism that escapes its effects. And both of those uh, appear to be true. 
So, and there are two basic evolutionary models for why aging exists. One is called mutation accumulation, and the other is called antagonistic pleiotropy. Mutation accumulation was first proposed by um, a British biologist called Peter Medawar. And he said, imagine a population of organisms that do not age. And one of the examples that's sometimes used with this are coffee cups or glasses in a canteen. There is actually a paper measuring the death rate of glasses in a university canteen. And the first time I came across it, it was published in the 50s. My first thought was, oh, my God, a tree died. So this could be printed. But... Um, what it showed is if you monitor glasses in a canteen, you can get a death rate of coffee cups or tumblers You, will, if you measure the rate at which they're broken. They're not dying from inside. But what you end up with, if you think about it, is you always end up with more chronologically old coffee cups than new coffee cups or tumblers. Not because there's anything wrong with them, but just because they've been around longer and had more chance think slightly freaky and let coffee cups have baby coffee cups what you would see is you will always get more offspring from the new members of a species than the old members not because there's anything wrong with them but just because there's more newbies than oldies and this is a foundational observation in the biology of aging known as the declining force of natural selection with time and the reason aging exists is because of the declining force of natural selection with time. Medawar himself proposed mutation accumulation and said, imagine you had genetic variation that kills an organism, but does not do so until after that organism has reproduced. That is what we in, in techno babble refer to as a fitness neutral allele. All right. And natural selection can't get rid of the damn thing because natural selection only works on number of offspring. So anything that happens post reproductively is. Mar went further and said, maybe what we think of as aging is just the accumulation of all these bad genetic variants that we can't get rid of. And a few years later, another one of the great evolutionary biologists, George Williams, took this idea and kind of supercharged it and said, imagine a genetic variation that makes you a better replicator early on in life. Even if it does bad stuff later on in life, that will be very heavily selected for in a population. Because for most organisms, most of the time in the wild, there is no later on. They are simply killed. And in every species that we've looked at so far, which frankly speaking is not many, aging results from a combination of those two mechanisms. Why does the why matter? Because the why gives us some information about the how of aging. It tells us that you know, aging is what we would call unprogrammed in that no genes or processes have evolved specifically to cause it. They are doing something else. And I think, along with my colleagues um, at Brighton, that it tells us something else about humans because humans are very odd evolutionarily. Most people don't realize it, but the human race went ex nearly went extinct about everybody alive today descends from less than a thousand individuals. And this is a very unusual evolutionary situation. The human population has teetered on the brink of extinction for about 10,000 generations. And genetically, it probably only started to behave like the kind of species a bio population biologist would study in a textbook about the year 1000. That's how odd humans are. And this combination of very small populations for very long periods of time has extreme effects on one of those two aging mechanisms, mutation accumulation. I don't want to get into 
how it does that. But what it basically means is that humans could age not so much in radically different ways to mammals, but the mechanisms of aging that we know about may operate with different priorities in us to the species we studied them in. Because evolutionarily, we aren't just different, we're weird. Interesting. Okay. No, I've not ha had it explained like that uh, before. Okay. Interesting. So within aging, at the moment, we, we have like these nine nine hallmarks that we think... Yeah. I, I think you have, well, it has to be a little... Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can talk to you a little bit about that. Within the how element of it, which is when you're talking about mechanisms or hallmarks, you are talking about how does aging work in an organism, in a person. Yeah. Um, always remember, these are a list of the ones we know about. Right. Okay. It does not mean that it is a definitive list, and it does not mean that there aren't more waiting to be uncovered. I'm absolutely certain there are. All right. So, you know, the, there's a cut, you know, the so we have a few mechanisms for which we have good evidence in some species that they cause aging. The of and some of them are examples of what I've just been talking about. So I sort of cut my teeth in the aging field, working on a mechanism called cellular senescence in humans when it was profoundly unfashionable. I was profoundly interested. And cell senescence, probably the best example of antagonistic pleiotropy, because the reason senescence exists, and we can get into how it works if you're interested, is it exists to keep you free of cancer in the early part of your life when you are reproductive. But post-reproductively, the penalty you pay for that is the accumulation of senescent cells and the, um, you know, and the disease, the things we think of as the diseases of aging, the things we think of as the natural changes, you know, gray hair and wrinkles, and the stuff we find really hard to classify, like immunosenescence. And don't forget, you know, through most of human history, you would never have seen an old person. I know this is an incredible thing to bear in mind, but if you went back to Paleolithic Europe, the lowest estimate for the population in the whole of Europe is about 5,000 people. And the highest estimate is about 100,000. And life expectancy is about 20. The likelihood that you would see anybody over the age of about 60 is vanishingly small. And that is reflected in the fossil record. To some extent. Okay, so, you know, that goes back to post reproductively, it didn't really matter. Nobody lives long enough. <laughs>